uh, Simon's lecturer, Janos Kolar, who is the Donner Professor of Science at Princeton. Uh, Janos received his PhD in 1984 under the direction of Matsusaka, and after uh, leaving Brandeis, he was a junior fellow at Harvard and went to Utah in 1987. Uh, and then in 1999, he went to Princeton. Uh, he was the AMS colloquium speaker in 2001, and in 2005, he was elected to the National Academy. Uh, he won the Cole Prize in 2006, and then last summer, he gave a plenary address at the ICM. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Janos for the first of three talks, and the next two will take place same time, same place, coming days. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. So I would like to, to talk about families of algebraic varieties. My, my plan is to, to keep this first talk sort of very simple, and so if you are planning to take a nap, this is probably the right time. So. Time to, to, to start it. Uh, and, so, and so the main questions that, that I would like to address, first, what is a good family of algebraic varieties? As an algebraic variety, some object given by equations, it is clear that you can start varying the coefficients, and then you get some kind of a family of algebraic varieties. Now, uh, we would say that some families are good, some families are bad, and we would like to understand what can we, can, 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 can we do with them. And, then, and the second question, so once we decided what the good families of R, then we would like to know how to describe all of the good families in some optimal manner. Okay? And so this will be. OK, now, so I think today I try to focus mostly on just history and s some very concrete, very simple examples. And then uh, tomorrow we'll give a survey of the recent results. And then, and th th then in the third talk, if there's still anyone left, I will discuss some more technical, interesting features of, the, of, of these. Yeah. And so the, I th think that the first case where, where where this family is were studied, and probably this, this would not have, have surprised Descartes already, that if you, that if you start in projective N space and you have a degree, the degree D hypersurface, that means that you are just looking at an equation which is homogeneous of, of degree D in the N plus 1 variables that form the homogeneous coordinates on the projective, projective space. And so now, then if, you, then if you just look at it as a very classical claim, I don't know to whom it can be attributed. Probably it was viewed as obvious from the very beginning that all degree D hypersurfaces in PM, they naturally they form a projective space themselves, so whose dimension is n plus d choose d minus 1. So n plus d choose d is just the number of monomials of degree d in n plus 1 variables, if I haven't miscomputed. And the correspondence is that the hypersurface just, just I just look at the coefficients of the monomials, and that gives me a point in projective space. OK, so this is, is maybe the simplest case where, where some varying, varying where so, so a varying family of algebraic varieties are described by the points of some other algebraic variety. Now, uh, th 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 there are some advantages of description. For instance, it works over any field. So for instance, if you are interested in hypersurfaces that define, say, over the reals or over the rationals or, or over a finite field, then the answer is already here. You don't need any further in the, the, the information. The hypersurface is defined over the rationale if and only if the corresponding point in projective space has rational coordinates. Okay? Uh, now, uh, the, the, and another feature which sort of you have to decide whether you like it or not, th that it counts multiplicities. So for, for, for instance, if my equation is just take one variable x0 and raise it to the d power set it equal 
value to zero. Um, so I, you, you might say that this is, is just a hyperplane, what we would, would, would like to say, and that in the classical it was, classical it was understood that sort of a default hyperplane, so it should be counted as a, as, as a hypersurface of degree d. Okay? But, but sort of this chorus, Pondence doesn't exactly describe the, just the simplest geometric objects. You have to add multiplicities into to the picture to, to make sure that the correspondence uh, works perfectly. And now, there's a very similar uh, description if instead of just starting with hypersurfaces, you just fix some algebraic variety in some large projective space, and you would like to describe it's hypersurface sections. Again, there's a natural uh, projective space whose points correspond to varieties that are hypersurfaces on some fixed n dimensional variety, the YM. Okay. Now, there's a more interesting thing case, which was, which was understood by Cayley in 1860. He wanted to this. To, 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 to describe space curves. And so, so people ha have studied plane curves a lot, so that falls under the previous one, but he looked instead at space curves. And then Cayley said that he wanted to parameterize them as, as follows. We look at the Grassmannian of lines in P3, and so just a set of all lines, but it turns out it's isomorphic to a quadric hypersurface in in, in, in P5. And then what has been called the Cayley transform for, for some time, given a curve, Cayley says, let's look at all the lines that have non-trivial intersection with that curve. And the term what Cayley proved is that this is a hypersurface in the Grassmannian. And we already know how to parameterize hypersurfaces in any variety in the Grassmannian, and it's especially simple. And so then, to, to a curve in three space this way, we can correspond a, a point in some projective space. And so it's also so interesting to know that this is really uh, very similar to the, the, to the, the, the radon transform that, that, that was discovered, I think, in the 1920s. That is sort of a discrete version of it in, in, in some sense. Now, and uh, then... Uh, I don't see why it's a hypersurface. It's supposed to be two. Oh, because you're varying on oh, various points, too. Okay, I see. I'm sorry. Okay, well... It is it's always good when questions are asked and answered in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, it has to be wrong. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. So so it's a it's a hypersurface. Yeah. It's 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 a nice idea, and it can be generalized to to our, our arbitrary dimension. If I have an n-dimensional variety that sits inside a much larger projective space, then then the natural thing to do is, instead of, instead of intersecting with lines, intersecting uh, with, uh, with linear subspaces, one less than the complementary dimension. And so then the general subspace will not intersect, but the ones that intersect, they form exactly a hypersurface. Okay? And so now, uh, and so and now for, for some reasons that I don't know, so you know, you know, these, uh, these are called the Chow varieties. And so if you fix the degree, uh, let's say this D for, for X, so now I'm looking at degree D sub-varieties of dimension N, so then to them, then the correspond performs a hypersurface in this, uh, the, this Gassmannian variety of capital N minus N minus one dimensional subspaces in an N dimensional uh, projective space. And it's not too hard to see that the ones that in fact come from some algebraic sub variety of degree D N dimension N, they form a, a 
closed sub variety here, and th that is called the Chow variety. So you've got equals there. It's a little bit misleading that they're equal to high, the, the, the high. Uh, yes, so maybe I should have said equal to the set of hypersurfaces. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the Chow variety is, is so, so if you start with an X, then you get the hypersurface in the Gasmanian. But in general, you do not get every hypersurface. Well, in fact, you never get every, every hypersurface. You get some special hypersurfaces. But sort of then these hypersurfaces, they correspond to some points in, in some projective space. And as x moves through all algebraic sub-varieties in Pn, we get an algebraic subset in this, this PM, and that's called the Chow variety. And so that means that, again, there is an algebraic variety, mm -hmm. though its description is rather complicated, to, whose points are in natural one-to-one -one correspondence with what uh, have been usually called n-dimensional cycles of degree d. So these are, are you know, the formal linear combinations of irreducible sub-varieties of dimension n, and the degree is defined in an obvious way. I just take the, the degree of the component, and there are some assigned multiplicities. Just multiply them, I add them up. Okay, and so then, then these will be the points of the Chow variety. Now, and so as I mentioned, the curve case was already known to Cayley here. And the actual proof that uh, we, we get a closed subset here, that's a, uh, there's some argument needed here, that's in a paper of Chow and Van der Waarden. And uh, so unlike the previous one, this, uh, this one has some field problems. So it works over any field, field of characteristic 0, but there are some problems with fields of characteristic p. And so there are some examples of Nagata that, that show that some unexpected things happen. And so, but, but I think for today's purposes, I'm, I'm staying mostly in characteristic zero. OK. Now, uh, uh, then of course, you might say that, that when we are interested in hypersurfaces, then Maybe we do not want to distinguish hypersurfaces that, that can be obtained from each other just by linear change of coordinates or by some isomorphism. Okay? So then maybe what we should really do is to l l look at not their hypersurfaces, but hypersurfaces up to isomorphism. Okay? Now, uh, uh, the, the, the first question we have to settle, what kind of isomorphism you mean? And so it can happen that two hypersurfaces are just isomorphic as ab abstract algebraic varieties. Or it can happen that there is a linear transformation that takes one into the other. And luckily, these notions are almost always the same. There are just a few exceptions. So e well, the first one, maybe not even worse, Mentioning, except we will deal with this when n equals 1, so then the hypersurface is just a set of points. And of course, if, if I have two sets of points of so the same cardinality, as an, as an abstract object, they are, are isomorphic, but not embedded isomorphic. Uh, it is slightly more interesting for plane curves where, where some, some problems happen up to degree 3. For instance, the simplest is the line and the plane conic, they are abstract isomorphic, but, 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 clearly not, not obtainable by linear transformation. And the, 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 the fact that the two notions are the same for plane curves of degree at least, at least 4 is not completely obvious. Uh, it, I was told it was probably known to Castelnuovo uh, there is a modern proof in a paper of, of Serrano. It's not hard, but, but it needs a little argument. And the, 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 the higher dimensions end up, so maybe instead of n equals 3, it should have said n at least 3. And the only problem is, is for degree 4 surfaces in P3. Otherwise, it's unique. The, the, 
the, the proof I know it, it is non-trivial though. So it, it sort of needs that the, the, the second cohomology of a hypersurface is torsion free. So the, 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 it might be a simpler argument, but, 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 but if you know this, the, which comes out of neutral left shed type arguments, then, the, then it's not hard to see that that the, 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 the abstract isomorphism is the same as embedded isomorphism. And so from now we will look at only the embedded isomorphism case. Uh, and so then one should say that the really interesting object, I mean if you are interested in hypersurfaces, is the is the hypersurfaces of degree D in Pn and mod the action of the automorphism group of Pn, which is just PGLM plus one. So that's the and then the, the, and our hope is that, that there's a nice algebraic variety whose points correspond to, to these hypersurfaces mod isomorphism. Now, but it turns out that, in fact, this is a horrible space. So if you want to, so th th there's no way this can be an algebraic variety. Well, let me try to convince you just a little bit. Well, so even if you don't know exactly what it is, uh, you, can, you can say just a few things about it. So for instance, how can we understand the, the, and the closure of a subset? Well, so we sort of don't know what the topology on this space is, but it's rather clear that, that it should have the following property. Well, let's assume that I have a family of algebraic varieties of the, the, the hypersurfaces. So I just have a, a po 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 polynomial in the variables x0, x, and, and t. It, 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 it has to, 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 to be homogeneous in the first n plus 1 variables, but, but it but doesn't not have to be a last one. And if I specify various values of t, then I get various hypersurfaces. And so, so I can ask what happens if the hypersurface that I get this way is contained in my subset u whenever t is non-zero. Then I would like to say that the hypersurface that I get at t equals zero, it should be contained in the closure of this set u. Okay, I, I hope everyone agrees that this is a rather minimal requirements that, that the sensible topology on this space should satisfy. Okay, and so now let's uh, write down some, some families. We start with an arbitrary hypersurface given by this equation. And then I just make it depend t by just multiplying the last n minus r coordinates by t. Okay? Now then, uh, as long as t is, is non-zero, I just did a coordinate change. So in fact, I have the same hypersurface as all numbers where t is non-zero. But when t equals zero, then I just, I just wiped out the last n minus r coordinates in my equation. And, and so the conclusion is that x0 raised to the this power, that is the only closed point of this space hypersurface dn. Why? Because I can do this thing, I suppose, for r equals 0. Yeah? And then, then uh, when I set t equals 0, then the only equation is x0 to the d. Okay? So, OK, so this is a, a, a place with lots of points, but there is only one closed point. It's not hard to see that this point in fact should be closed, at least under these operations. It's indeed closed. OK, and so why you say that uh, maybe the problem is that we are allowing these, these sort of funny hypersurfaces of degree d. I mean, it's not a really degree d hypersurface, so maybe let's disallow it, OK? And so what can we do? Well, we can uh, assume that, OK, let's deal only with hypersurfaces whose equations have no multiple factors, OK? Then what happens? Well, you can do exactly the same trick, just instead of, of focusing on the first variable, you can go to the first two variables, and you see that these 
will be the only closed points. And so, so a, again here, instead of having one plane, you will have sort of d, uh, d different hyperplanes where they meet a co-dimension two set. This will be the only closed points. OK, then you say, let's go, go further. If you know what normal is, it is not too bad. Then the closed points end up, well, now you have stretched yourself to three variables. So these are just cones over, over smooth plane curves. These will be the only closed points that correspond to the, the normal ones. Uh, now, well, at, at this point, maybe you get desperate and say, but, but yeah, but these have some sort of two bad properties. And so uh, one thing uh, very special happens with these is that the, 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 these are just cones. So they have a point of very high multiplicity, D. Okay? And then the, the other thing is that they are cones. So maybe with the next hope is that, OK, so let's assume that we are just looking at hypersurfaces that have isolated singularities, and they are not cones. Okay. What happens here? Well, in this case, I don't know exactly what the closed points are, but some funny things still happen. Let's look at this example. So it, it sort of it changes. Something interesting happens only in the first two variables. And so, so when this variable t is non-zero, uh, then I get the same hypersurface, and it has only one isolated singularity of multiplicity d half. But when the t is zero, then I pick up two isolated singularities of multiplicity d half. Okay, and so so these are sort of not bad. Your singular set is now very very small. Yeah, that's, that's isolated singularities, and the multiplicity is is not high. I mean, the maximum possible is d, and I'm at, I'm at, at d half. Yeah? So, so, and so this says that, that uh, if the space uh, 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 exists, then it still has two points where one is in the closure of the other. Okay? So this will still not be some algebraic variety that, that will parameterize hypersurfaces with isolated singularities that are and and they should not be cones. So so it's it, it's to, to getting down to some very nice examples where still some bad things happen. And uh, and the, the, then the first solution it it, it, it comes from Mumford's geometric invariant theory. So he was building on Hilbert's work so so maybe at least some part of it was already known to, to, to Hilbert. Mumford has a notion of, of, of stability, he says, which hypersurfaces are, are stable. And the stable set, so, so, so the, the, the stable hypersurfaces, mod isomorphism, that's a very nice algebraic variety, is nearly least. Smooth so singularities are very, very mild, only quotient singularities. Uh, the problem it is that this is, is non-compact. And then he has another notion, which is semi-stable. This space is not as nice. It has some more complicated singularities, but it gives a, a compact algebraic variety. Now. And so uh, one good property of this notion is that the smooth hypersurface is stable. So the, the, the example I had on the previous uh, slide, it could not have been done with smooth hypersurfaces. So at least we know that. But there are some not so good properties of this notion. One is that we really have no idea what else is stable if the degree is at least four, or if the dimension is at least four, and so even I think, I think for three folds in dimension in P four, I think it's it is not fully known what is stable and what is semi-stable, and and it seemed like a very very complicated answer. So if there, uh, and the other. The problem is that the semi-stable points in this compactification, they do not correspond to an actual hypersurface, but they 
correspond to some isomorphism, some so they correspond to several different hypersurfaces. Okay, and so yeah, so I, so I I see that the experts are already asleep, both in the first and the last row. And so okay, so maybe that's a good sign. I was told, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was told once that that, uh, that is a good sign. Okay, <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. Now, an other problem with, with hyper-surfaces, this was discovered by, by Mori, yeah? and so that, that maybe we should, we should enlarge this space. So, so his example said we, we start with two homogeneous polynomials, one of degree d and the other of degree d times e. And then, then we write down this family of hypersurfaces, where I just take the first equation and raise it to, to, to the e's power and add it to, to, to t to the e times the second equation. And so then, then, then at least for small values of t, uh, non-zero, this is a nice sm smooth hypersurface of, of degree d times e. But uh, when I set t equals 0, well, the, uh, the, I get this lower degree, this degree d hypersurface, but sort of e times. OK, now this is not surprising so far. But then what he noticed that, that, uh, is that we can modify this by just b b blowing up the set uh, in this family where gx x equals 0. And so sort of now we have a smooth family of algebraic varieties, but the general fiber is not changed. It is a smooth hypersurface of degree DE, but the special fiber becomes a smooth variety that is an E-sheeted cover of the hypersurface GX equals 0. Okay? And now we think that smooth families, they are, they, they are nice, so maybe they should be allowed in any the moduli uh, problem, but here I have some limits that are are not smooth. Oh, sorry, Th that are not hypersurfaces. So, so, so smooth hypersurfaces they can have smooth limits that are that are not hypersurfaces. Now it's not clear. How can one understand all of these limits? Are there more complicated limits like this? Uh, we don't know. There is a, an interesting question here. So you see that, that for these examples to work, the degree has to be a, has to be a composite number d times z. E. And so, so I don't know if there are examples like this for prime degree hypersurfaces. So, I think for d equals 3, this is probably known, but, but already for d equals 5, it is, it is not clear what happened. OK, so I am sorry? You, you have dimension larger than 3 or d. Uh, let's see. So I think in dimension 2, there is this example of Horikawa. I think Quintix can exactly degenerate. You can. So, so the, 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 there is more freedom with surfaces. It's easier to work with surfaces than with threefold hypersurfaces. So, I think it would not surprise me to, to find examples for surfaces where something like this happens. But the, but the higher dimensions, it, 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 it seems harder. Okay, and so now, so after all this, maybe I would like to spend some, some um, uh, more time on the moduli space of the genus two curve. So some some very s s simple concrete examples. So the C, you can think of it either as a smooth projective curve of genus two. And so that is algebraic variety. If you prefer complex analysis, then it's a smooth, compact Riemann surface of, of genus 2. Now, 
uh, it is known, or you can just ac accept that this is what we're interested in, <coughs> that for these, these curves, as, uh, th th there's a unique map to, 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 to CP1, and it has degree D, and it ramifies at six points. And in fact, the six points uniquely determine this curve C. So then if you want to write down an affine equation, we can write it as z square is a degree 6 polynomial of x. Now it's non-homogeneous. And the smoothness of the curve corresponds to the condition that is f should have no multiple roots. OK? OK. A and so, so we can say by this that if I look at m2, which is the set or the space or algebraic variety that's supposed to, to parameterize all smooth projective curves of genus 2 is just a set of all, all possible way of choosing six points in P1 up to the, the action of PGL2. Or you can say that, that you take the six symmetric power of P1 and remove all the diagonals and you quotient it out by PGL2. So uh, again, as long as, as the curves are, are smooth, there is this, this construction. And again, uh, and indeed in this case, the quotient is a nice algebraic variety that, that can be described in lots of different ways. Now the interesting thing happens when we want to compactify this. And so now the natural idea that we can just, of course, we had six distinct points. We can let some of the points run together. And so then, then what can we say? And for instance, here is an, an example where in the limit, we have four points coming together. Yeah? So if you look at, at this equation, the first four factors contain a t. So when t becomes 0, it just becomes x to 4 times, and the other two are, are unchanged. And then, well, we can do, 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 do this, this coordinate change, that x, uh, let it be t times x prime, and we, we leave y just unchanged, but we call it y prime. And then, but if you do this substitution, then the whole thing becomes divisible by t to 4. And then we divide by it. And then after that, uh, we get this new family here, uh, where you see the, and so the first four factors are now constant. And the last two, two they contain t. And so when t becomes 0, then, then these two points come together, but these four, they stay, stay distinct, OK? So now, if we just included all possible six points, then we would say that this is a, that this is a, a problem that this limit with four points together and these two separate, that should be the same as these four points separate and then, then, then these two together. Uh, but we already know that in order to get a nice good quotient, we have to throw away something from the space of all hypersurfaces. And so the question is, what do we need to, to, to throw away? And I mean, clearly, when, when four points come together, it's worse than when two points come together. And so we throw away when, when the four points, points come together. And in fact, it's not hard to see that this trick is in fact rather general, and uh, and we can throw away everything where at least four point, four point come come together. So that means that we have to deal with at most triple roots. Now, what happens with triple roots? Well, then here is again, again, an example. This has a triple root at x equals zero. And so then here, what you should, should think, so we have this triple root at 0, and I have three other roots. And I just act by C star to push the three other roots off to, to, to infinity. Now, then in the limit, I 
still have the triple root at the origin, but I also have a triple root at in infinity. And so then for triple roots, I can always just move them around and until in the limit, I just get, get x cubed times y cubed, so I have two triple roots, okay? So that means, and it, so it turns out this is exactly what GIT the will do in this case. That the, you know, the points in this case they they correspond to there is one point where there are two two, two, two triple roots, and then otherwise I have at most double roots. So so the, then this will be the GIT compactification. Now then what are the corresponding curves? Well, and so. Here, the first case, well, I sort of, it, to, to sort of see it, it better, before I had the other the triple root at infinity, I moved it to x equals 1 to see the singularity better. So now we see that I guess z squared equals x cubed times x minus 1 cube. That, that is rational with, with the two cusp singularities, like z squared equals x cubed. That's, a, that's the cusp. Now, otherwise, I have at most double roots. There is one special case of this. It's always an irreducible curve. There, there is only one exception uh, when I have three double roots. Okay? So then it becomes the union of, of, of two rational curves. Okay? And so, so now, um, what to do? Well, if, 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 if you would like to deal actually with curves, then, then you are sort of happy with the first case. That's an irreducible curve. It has, it has two, two cusps. That's not something the, the, the classical geometers would have worried about it. And then the second case, well, that's also so nice, I get almost always irreducible curve. There is one reducible reducible case, and, and it seems that classical geometers they did not like reducible curves. They knew about them, but, but so they never uh, thought that they are really, really worth studying on 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 their own, own right. So let's try to make an irreducible curve out of it. And so and so I have what? I have sort of one rational curve, so I was hoping to draw on the board, but if I do it, you can't see it. And so, hmm? and so if someone knows how to raise one screen, but anyhow, I think I just, yes? Yes? Okay. Okay. No, that's fine. Okay. Yes. And so, uh, okay. Yeah. and so you can think about it. So, and and you can imagine the solution, something like this. So this over the point minus one, this over zero, and this over one. And now. And so then you say, okay, let's pick just one of these curves. But of course, the way to, to pick this curve, if you imagine that this is a limit of a smooth family of, of curves, then just throwing it out is, of course, not something that's allowed. But you can decide, for instance, we can just contract this curve to a point. And then, oh, of course, the other rational curve remains, but these three points, they will come together. And then it's not hard to compute that the way they, they come together, you have the singularity like the three coordinate axes in, in, in three space. So it will not be a planar singularity, but uh, we'll have this, this three dimension. So, so then the limit is just a rational curve uh, with a triple point uh, like the three coordinate axes. OK. And so uh, the, then if we do this, this, uh, this compactification, and I hope to, to assign some. Okay, yeah, let's go down. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, and I hope to assign some, some, some geometric curves to them. 
then what will be the objects that I'm parameterizing? I think she is working on it. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so, so whether we be smooth genus two curves, uh, that's nice. That's what we want. Then there will be will be genus one curves with one node. That's also still nice. And then there will be genus zero curve curve with two nodes. And the, the, then this new object, the genus zero curve with one triple point, like the three coordinate axes. Okay, so. At least you said theoretically, we in fact did very well that we have a nice compact space and there is a natural well, way that algebraic curves correspond to, to the point of this space. Okay? Um, on the other hand, my claim is that this is in fact a very unpleasant compactification of the moduli of, of smooth curves. Okay, and so yeah, there. Are. And so it is clear the technical difficulties show that I really should not have considered this compactification. That, <laughs> that is just it just it, it just leads to problems. But so I would like to go through at least some of the problems lems, that we have. Well, so. So, for instance, well, th 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 there is a family here of 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 uh, these uh, these uh, uh, genus two curves, and and you see what happens happens here that so as long as t is is non-zero, I get a smooth curve. But at t equals 0, I get a curve that I did not uh, uh, allow. This has only one cusp. Yeah? This is only one triple, triple root. And I said the only thing, thing we allow is when there are, there are two. And it, it t -t -t turns out, it, 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 we, we will follow from some computations that we will do next time, that there's no way to 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 modify this by a coordinate change to get an allowed limit. So th 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 there's a very nice family here, but we cannot change it to, to a family that our moduli space uh, allows. OK. Now, then another example is more a technical one, that if I start with, with this family, so when t equals 0, then this is allowed. So because it has a triple root at x equals 0, and it has a triple root at x equals 1. And now then you, you, you start looking at, the, at, the, at the, the, the Taylor expansion. And, and at the, the first order level, you see that this looks like a non-allowed family. Because because the triple root at x equals one one, <laughs> one one stays, but the triple root at x equals zero try it it starts to break up into three different points and that's not allowed. And you go up to order m minus one, it looks like it's a not allowed family, but then at at the, the m sort there you suddenly start moving away the the, the triple root at also so one. So that means that this is an allowed family, but you cannot see it by the beginning of, of the Taylor expansion at the point t equals 0. And we l l l like the step-by-step -step computation a, a lot. So this is a, this is a very unpleasant news, news technically. OK, now uh, then, then, then this example that's behind this board, but, uh, behind this screen, but let's not, not raise it. So, so you see, uh, what I did, I picked one of the, 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 the two curves. I contracted it, and then the other curve remained. Of course, I could have done it the other way. I could have picked the other curve and, and, and contracted it. Now, it turns out that I get the same 
I get the same curve. Why? Because because to get this curve, what I need, I well, I have CP1. I have to pick three points in it that's unique up to a coordinate change, and I just identify the 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 three points. So that means I get the 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 same curve, but if I start with this family that I have here, then I can, still there are two ways to, to, to look at the family that's allowed. Yeah, I can contract one curve or I can contract the other curve. And these two families are not isomorphic. Well, and so maybe I should have added some more general terms just like T. So maybe here, here, the doing something makes them actually the, the isomorphic. But there's no isomorphism between them. That's an isomorphism. That's the identity for, for T non-zero. And if I had written it down better, then indeed they would not, be, not be, be isomorphic. And so what kind of, what kind of a modular I, I space this is? And so let's try to to then look at this, what happens at this point. So what should be the local model of the, of the moduli space? I explain here a lower dimensional example. And so, so first, let's start with, with two copies of the complex line. And I just glue them along, along C minus 0. Now, if you. You, you, you use the inversion to glue them, then of course, then you get CP1 and everyone is happy. But I use the identity to, 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 to glue them. So then it, then it looks like I have the F fine line, and for zero, I just, just put in suddenly the two points. So that's the simplest example of the non separated scheme that you can get. OK, uh, but now let's. Take the quotient here. By essentially the action of z goes to to minus z, but over the the where the origin instead of a fixed point, well, I have two points I can interchange them. Okay, so then suddenly I have now a fixed point free action on this. So when I take the quotient, well, what happens there? So so. It sort of looks like on the set theory level, I just got the usual C quotiented out by, by plus or minus. I have exactly the, the, the same set. But you see, this is isomorphic to C. And then the, the, the quotienting out, out it has a, a fixed point. But now I do not have a, a, a fixed point here. And so then the, 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 I get some strange object. But it sort of looks like this, like, like the C quotiented out, but the tangent space at the origin is, is what I, I had up here. So that, that means it's something non-separated, which, uh, which does not have extra points. So if I just do this, this gluing is clear why it's not separated, because there are two points where only one point should be. Now, I get something here that does not have extra points, but it has some extra tangent directions that should not be there. And so, so it was Artin in, in a paper in 1974 who, who pointed out that, that, for instance, that if you look at the moduli space of smooth surfaces, then these kind of examples occur all the time. Okay? So that means that although these are some very Really strange uh, objects. These are not algebraic varieties, not stacks. They, at least, if you want to live with, with, with smooth surfaces in in your moduli spaces, they happen all the time. Oh, of course, then my exam. Of, of course, then my answer will be that you should abandon on smooth surfaces. That is that just an artifice, and 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 we should should go. Go further. Okay, so now and so then now, now after this came uh, the, the Lean Mumford compactification of, well, so here is just uh, for a, a, M2. Now, now we will have it for an arbitrary genus. And so, um, 
So oh, but, but, but I know the compactification, the Dulling Mumford compactification of the smooth curves of genus G is uh, it, 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 it has been used so much, and, and I think there's a whole generation that completely grew up with the idea that, well, maybe the aim of algebra geometry is to study this space, yeah? I think that's it. Uh, that, that it's hard to, to, to believe that there was a time when it was not obvious that this is the right thing to do. Yeah? That, 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 that sort of it really, uh, it, it somehow needed Dulling and Mumford to, to, to come up with this idea and to make it work. And so, so, so in this case, in this very simplest case, it says that, well, so uh, when we have, when we have at most double roots, then we keep these. These are nice. Yeah. Now, then, in this case, uh, when there are three double roots, then we keep it as is. We just accept that it's a reducible curve. It has just, just two components. They intersect sect in three points. These are ordinary nodes. There is nothing wrong with this. And so we, so we just keep it. Now, then the question is what to do with these examples where there are three points coming I mean, to, 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 together. And then the answer is, well, we just blow up of these points where three thing, things come together. And now, now I have a new central fiber. This will, this will be now a double cover of a pair of intersecting lines. So it will not be now a double cover of, of P1, but instead of just, just one P1 on which these three points came together here, we, we e e extended it to another P1, and there are three ramification points here, and there are three ramification points here. Yeah. And there is this double cover. Now, of course, over P1, there is no double cover that ramifies at three points. So the only possibility is that there is these points where the two lines meet. There has to be a ramification point there. That means that I get that in fact there are now together four ramification points on both components. So I have two elliptic curves and they meet at this, this one point. So this will, uh, will be now the, the, and the last object that, that we get. And then the claim is that this is a very, very nice space. Now, uh, and then one can generalize this and just go to arbitrary re, uh, re genus. So we would like the interior of this space to, to parameterize smooth, smooth projective curves of, of genus D, G, but in the limit we allow some reducible curves, and they will be also singular. So these will be the stable curves. So these will be projective, connected, and reduced curves. I think the, these are so, you know, you know, you know, the obvious uh, conditions. And now the more interesting thing, condition with, that, will, that we will then try to generalize to higher dimensions, that will be a local condition that the singularities, they should not be too bad. And in the curve case, we want to allow only nodes. So locally and analytically, we just have two, two smooth branches meeting transversally. And there will be a global condition that, 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 that omega c is ample. So what is omega c? Well, so if, if, if you are on a smooth curve, uh, then it's just a sheaf of one form, so this capital omega c, or it, it is the dual of the holomorphic tangent space, and then if you algebraic geometry, k is the canonical class, so then it's this sheaf. And I think I may refer to this as the dualizing sheaf, sheaf frequently, though for our purposes it really does not matter that it's the dualizing sheaf. And so, uh, okay, now um, 
And then, uh, what is omega c for singular curves? Well, so it is actually easiest to understand what happens if it's a singular curve in the plane. There is a natural Poincaré residue map map for 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 smooth curve, which that that if you get two forms that have a pole along C. You can take, take the residue along C, and then you get this omega C. And so uh, the, the, this works for, for a smooth curve. And essentially, by definition, uh, we say that if you have a singular plane curve, then this omega C should be what you get out of this residue map. And other way to understand it, so it's a line bundle on the curve. And what happens when you restrict to the irreducible component, then you recover not exactly this omega ci, but you allow poles along the points where the nodes were. Okay, so then, then, so then, this is the the sheaf. Let's see. Should, let's see what's on the next slide. Okay, so now then the then the higher dimensional questions that I want to, to address. First, what are the correct analogs of smooth projective curves of genus at least two? So what should be that corresponds to the interior of the moduli space? And what are the correct analogs of, of stable curves? What kind of, kind of more singular and reducible limits do we allow? And now, it, it turns out that usually it is easy to, 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 to create a moduli problem that gives you a reasonable open moduli space, as, uh, as uh, we have seen. But it is much harder to make sure that you, get <coughs> that, that you get a sensible compact moduli space. And so this will be, this will be our job tomorrow. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much.